Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Runcie, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. You'll be aware that book festivals have expanded in number over the last 20 years, blending the idea of a town hall debate, the public lecture, and maybe even school assembly. <laughs> They've become the secular space for challenging discussions and honest debate. This particular festival in Edinburgh is known for its international range and cultural depth. But it also has a moral purpose, a conscience, as it were. And for many years, this, it has been blessed by the honest, benevolent and thoughtful presence of Richard Holloway, the former Bishop of Edinburgh, whose books include Godless Morality, Doubt and Loves, On Forgiveness, the wonderful autobiography Leaving for Alexandria, and his contemplation of the end of life in Waiting for the Last Bus. Richard Holloway's fierce, candid, and vulnerable interrogation of the possibilities and the problems of the Christian faith lies at the heart of his writing and continues in this lecture today, Stories We Told Ourselves. He's going to talk, and I'm going to ask him a few questions and then throw it open to you. And he's going to talk about what for many people is the most important subject of all, our own mortality, the hope of redemption from death through faith, and the difficulty of believing in a loving God while living in a world of seemingly inexplicable suffering, pain, and injustice. What does it take to have faith in what the 1965 Hollywood film called The Greatest Story, ever told. And is it true, John Betjeman asked in his poem, Christmas, and is it true this most tremendous tale of all, seen in a stained glass window's hue, a baby in an ox's stall, the maker of the stars and sea became a child on earth for me? And is it true, for if it is, no loving fingers tying strings around those tissued fripperies, the sweet and silly Christmas things, bath salts, and inexpensive scent, the hideous tie so kindly meant. No love that in a family dwells, no caroling in frosty air, nor all the steeple-shaking bells can with this single truth compare that God was ma made man in Palestine and lives today in bread and wine. What does it mean to grapple with this story for your whole life? Please welcome Richard Holloway. <laughs> Thank you, James. <clears throat> uh, thank you, <clears throat> James, for, especially for the Betjeman. Um, or we might have had Thomas Hardy, too. Um, and thank you all for coming. Whether or not we acknowledge it, we all live by the stories we've told ourselves to explain the mystery of our existence, the suffering that accompanies it, and the certain death that concludes it. The Christian religion has been one of the most prolific tellers of the stories by which many of us have tried to live. But what story can it possibly tell that will account for the ancient and abiding sorrows of children? That is the great stumbling block many of us can't climb over in our search for the meaning or purpose of the universe. <clears throat> in a collection of essays published in 1979 called The White Album, Joan Didion captured the problem. She writes, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. We live entirely by the imposition of a narrative line upon disparate images by the ideas with which we have learned to freeze the shifting phantasmagoria which is our actual experience, or at least we do for a while. I am talking here about a time when I began to doubt the premises of all the stories I had ever told myself, a common condition, but one I found troubling. She then describes the incident that prompted this beginning of doubt in the stories she had told herself. I read in the papers the story of Betty Lansdowne Fouquet, a 26-year-old woman with faded blonde hair, 
who put her five-year-old daughter out to die on the center divider of Interstate 5, some miles south of the last Bakersfield exit. The child, whose fingers had to be pried loose from the cyclone fence when she was rescued 12 hours later by the California Highway Patrol, reported that she had run after the car, carrying her mother and stepfather and brother and sister for a long time. Certain of those images did not fit any narrative I knew. <coughs> I know that feeling of uncertainty and discomfort, but my discomfort is no longer that of the confident believer who has to fit that incident into the story of how a good God could have come up with a universe in which that kind of thing happens every day. Even when I was telling myself that story, I was never persuaded by the explanations offered by theologians. They demonstrated to me what has always been a weakness in most theological systems, a discomfort with uncertainty that impels a compulsion to explain or account for every mystery under the sun. I wonder now if this is not a consequence of the male domination of religious and political systems down the ages. The feminist writer Rebecca Solnit coined the term mansplaining to describe the experience of listening to a man condescendingly explaining something to her he thinks she cannot possibly understand. It's a well-known phenomenon. <coughs> Solnit can, uh, attributes it to a combination of overconfidence and cluelessness, <laughs> a not infrequent combination in the male of the human species. <laughs> and it's rife in Christianity, which has a passion for proclaiming its confident solutions to all the existential puzzles that beset us. I have always thought believing Jews were more honest about the problem of suffering than believing Christians, like the rabbis in Auschwitz who put God on trial, found him guilty, and then said the evening prayer. I am moved by those who believe in God like that, but reject the divine justification story. Its best expression in literature was given by Ivan Karamazov in Dostoevsky's great novel. Ivan has collected an unbearable anthology of the sufferings of Russian children. He tells his devout brother Alyosha that he positively maintains that this quality exists in much of mankind, this love of torturing children. It is precisely the defenselessness of these children that tempts the torturers. And then he goes on. I want to be there when everyone suddenly finds out what it was all for. All religions in the world are based on this desire. And I, I am a believer. But then the, there are the children. And what am I going to do with them? That is the question I cannot resolve. There are hosts of questions, but I've taken only the children because here what I say is irrefutably clear. If everyone must suffer in order to buy eternal harmony with their suffering, pray tell me what children have to do with it. It's quite incomprehensible why they should have to suffer and why they should buy harmony with their suffering. It's not that I don't accept God, Alyosha. I just most respectfully return him the ticket. <laughs> it's worth spending a minute to think about the collision of stories implied in Ivan's outburst, because it is something that comes up again and again in human experience. The stories we tell ourselves to make sense of our lives often come into conflict with each other. So we either choose to live with the contradiction or we abandon one of the stories. Ivan's problem was that he was unable to live with the discord and was forced to give up 
one of the stories he'd been told. The founding story behind his outrage is the existence of a good, all-powerful God whose creatures we are. But another story within that story has to follow immediately. In order to account for the existence of suffering in the world created by such a good God. In the passage from the brothers Karamazov I've quoted from, we only get hints of how that part of the story has been explained to Ivan. But it seems to have been along the lines of an eternal harmony that could only be purchased <clears throat> at the price of such sorrow. This is the element in the story Ivan rejects, not in disbelief, but in revulsion. He wants no dealings with a God who can come up with a scheme that involves the suffering of children, even if their pain is to be justified when the meaning of the universe is finally revealed. So he respectfully returns him the ticket. My dilemma is the opposite of Ivan's. Ivan accepted God, but wanted to keep his distance from him and the community of faith that bowed to him. I'm not sure I do accept God, or how God has been traditionally defined or understood. That's one prong of my dilemma. But the other is that unlike Ivan Karamazov, I find myself unable to tear up the ticket of my membership in one of the communities that worships the God I don't think I believe in, the Christian church. I tried to do that <clears throat> 20 years ago. I thought I'd thrown away the ticket forever. Then slowly over the years, I found myself coming home again. My ticket frayed at the edges, smudged and bleared, but reclaimed. So what kind of confused story am I telling myself these days? Here I want to return to Joan Didion to help me. As a writer, Didion became an explorer of what she calls the shifting phantasmagoria of actual human experience. Phantasmagoria <clears throat> is a disconcerting word to use, and a writer as careful as Didion won't have used it casually. It comes loosely from the Greek for ghastly presences encountered in public spaces. It was coined to describe a kind of horror show that was designed to terrify people. It used what was called a magic lantern hidden at the back of a darkened room that projected terrifying images onto a screen in front of a suggestible and often hysterical audience. Didion is saying that the horror show is art imitating life the way good art always does. It represents what she calls our actual experience. In this case, the fact that we live in a world in which a young mother can put her five-year-old daughter out to die on a Californian highway. I don't think our difficulty is in finding a story that will make sense of an event like that. After all, the story we choose may be that no sense can be made of it, because the universe itself makes no sense, it has no meaning, is just a weird, indifferent process in which terrible things happen every day. Now, I don't think our problem is with the differences in the stories we tell. It's that telling stories is not what we think many of us are doing when we're actually doing it. We all think we are engaging with reality as it is. We are offering objective descriptions of the way things are. We are pinning down the facts, but there's always a caveat, a catch, and the catch is that while this is the truth of what we are doing, it's not what others are up to. Their efforts often are just stories, stuff they made up, comforting illusions they wanted to believe in, while our stories are the truth. And who can blame us for 
playing these games <clears throat> without being aware of that that's what we're doing. To use Martin Heidegger's word for the human situation, we were all thrown or shot into a universe that does not explain itself. So we are left trying to figure it out for ourselves as we go along. And here I must pause for a moment to remember that this great philosopher, who helped many of us make sense of our existence, also embraced one of the vilest stories humanity has ever told itself when he sided with the Nazi regime in Germany in the 1930s. A particularly ugly detail in the Heidegger phantasmagoria is that some of his most devoted students were Jews, including his young lover, Hannah Arendt, yet he never uttered a word of blame about the Holocaust that destroyed six million of them in the Nazi death camps. As the poet W. H. Auden said of W. B. Yeats, that's because Heidegger was silly like us. The powerful thinkers and system builders often are the great explainers. And that's why I prefer poets and artists who are content to express or show the human condition to philosophers and theologians who grab me by the arm and insist on telling me precisely what it's all about because they know. Auden's metaphor for the universe was a haunted wood into which without any choice in the matter, I was propelled at birth and from which I shall be expelled at death, echoing Beckett's words from Godot that we're all born astride the grave. As I get near the edge of the trees, something in me wants to reconcile the contradictory stories I told myself as I made my way. But that's not all I want to do. As well as reconciling and finding space for contradictions, there are some stories I want to resist. These are the stories that channel humanity's innate instinct for violence, that strange lust in us to destroy the stranger, the different, the other. I am conscious of the presence of such violence in my own lived experience. I am aware of the fury that can accompany disagreement over the profound issues that beset us in life. And I have found, I've felt in myself and been disturbed by this kind of violence. And Nietzsche and Freud have helped me understand it. Nietzsche thought that the psychic pain that can overwhelm us as we make our way through the haunted wood impels us to reach for an enemy or hate figure on whom we can vent our vengeance for the sufferings we are undergoing. These are his words. Every sufferer instinctively seeks a cause for his suffering, more exactly an agent, still more specifically a guilty agent who is susceptible to suffering. In short, some living thing upon which he can, on some pretext or other, vent his feelings actually or an effigy. For the venting of his feelings represents the greatest attempt on the part of the suffering to win relief, anesthesia, the narcotic he cannot help desiring to deaden pain of any kind, end of quote. Freud went further than Nietzsche, and he noticed that our most likely scapegoat, scapegoats are neighbors or associates who betray marginal differences from us, onto whom we can fix reasons for our suffering. This is why some of the grimmest conflicts in history have been between communities that lived alongside each other for ages to some aggrieved person exploded a real or metaphorical bomb that blew apart centuries of tolerance. He called this phenomenon the narcissism of minor differences. And he said its root lay in the aggressiveness which civilization had insisted we must sacrifice 
for the sake of the advantages it offered, but which was always there inside us, crouching below the surface, waiting for the occasion of its violent release. This is what he wrote. It is clearly not easy for men to give up the satisfaction of this inclination to aggression. They do not feel comfortable without it. The advantage which a comparatively small cultural group offers of allowing this instinct an outlet in the form of hostility against intruders is not to be despised. It is always possible to bind together a considerable number of people in love so long as there are other people left over to receive the manifestation of their aggressiveness. I gave this phenomenon the name the narcissism of minor differences. We can see now that it is a convenient and relatively harmless satisfaction of the inclination to aggression by means of which co cohesion between members of community is made easier. Harmless satisfaction of the inclination to aggression? Unless, of course, you belong to the group that is its object at any particular moment in history. European Jews, the community Freud had in mind when he was writing that essay in 1930. Given the right circumstances, the harmless satisfaction of the inclination to aggression against a marginal community can lead to the Holocaust of six million Jews in Nazi gas ovens in the 20th century, or to the persecution of Irish Catholic immigrants in Scotland in the 19th and early 20th centuries, an example from our own day in Britain was the state-sponsored persecution of the Windrush generation of West Indian immigrants, the effects of which are still reverberating in our divided country today. So we should remember that the stories we tell ourselves can have devastating consequences for other people. We should be careful how we tell them, and we should probe them for their implicit hatreds and dismissals. Let me now remind you of one of the most famous stories we've ever told ourselves. In his magnificent new study of the Bible, John Barton writes these words. King's College, Cambridge, holds a ceremony of nine lessons and carols every Christmas Eve, broadcast throughout the English-speaking world and imitated in many churches. As the title indicates, it includes nine readings from the Bible interspersed with hymns and carols. And at the beginning of the service, there is a bidding which includes what amounts to an interpretation of the whole Bible in one sentence. This is a bit of the bidding. Let us read and mark in Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God from the first days of our disobedience unto the glorious redemption brought us by this holy child. And then Martin says, the Bible is seen here as telling a story of disobedience and redemption, of sin and salvation, of paradise lost and paradise regained concerning the whole human race. The Bible is thus understood as a story about a disaster followed by a rescue mission, and this fits with the nature of Christianity as a religion of salvation. This is a story many of you here today will be familiar with. You may even like listening to King's College Cambridge on Christmas Eve. You may even find it in your own church. Let me sketch the elements that went into this story. And I'm not thinking of its historical ingredients. I'm thinking of its existential ingredients. And here we, t we return to Joan Didion and Ivan Karamazov and the sufferings of children. What story can we tell that will make sense of their tears? If you need a picture to help you, summon the stunned and bloodied image of Omran, the little Syrian boy, 
called, pulled from the ruins of a bombed-out building in Aleppo in August 2016. How can you forget that image? The wee soul covered in dust and rubble and blood, twitching, unsure of what had happened to him. Hold that in your mind's eye. To telegraph centuries of theological development into a couple of paragraphs, what happened over centuries of human distress and the questions it prompted was the emergence of a story theologians call apocalyptic from the Greek word for unveiling. Think of the curtains going back in the Lyceum at the beginning of a play. That's apocalypsis, unveiling. The great New Testament scholar, John Dominic Crossan, described apocalyptic religion as the hope of broken people everywhere who can't believe God will leave them forever at the mercy of the cruelty of tyrants. And the solution offered is found in many religious traditions. But in the Hebrew Bible, its most obvious emergence is in Daniel, a strange book written in code that prophesied the coming of one who would finally end the pains of the children of the earth and inaugurate a new era of love and justice. This is what he wrote. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. In the Christian telling of this story, the coming one was believed to be a first-century Jew called Jesus, who proclaimed a message that challenged the way the powerful ordered the world to suit themselves. In the dispensation to come, their order would be reversed. Down would be up, and up would be down. The poor would be blessed with bread enough for every day. Prisons would be emptied of the despised and rejected that fill them all over the world at the moment, as they did then. The mighty would be humbled, and the humble exalted. And the children of the poor would laugh and dance in the streets of the redeemed city everywhere. And even as he hung on the cross, onto which the powerful had contemptuously nailed him as a dangerous dreamer, Jesus expected God to erupt into history and bring in his reign finally of justice and peace and end the suffering of children. God did not respond. After his death, when his followers experienced his presence in a new way, they still expected God to act in their lifetime and bring in the kingdom. They too died waiting. Still the church waits for the curtains to open and the new earth to be revealed. Still they remain firmly closed. So is that all that is left of the Christian story then? The hope that one day God will come into history and make all things new, the implication being that so far we've just misunderstood the apocalyptic timetable? No. There's another way of telling the story, and it's found in a fragment of a gospel that never made it into the official New Testament. It's called the Gospel of Thomas. This is what it says. His disciples said to him, when will the kingdom come? Jesus said, it, it will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, here it is or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. The new world has already come, but we do not see it because we're looking in the wrong place. It is an underground resistance movement, and we are invited to join it and to use the guerrilla tactics of courage and compassion against the forces of injustice and oppression. We don't blow up bridges, but we blow up arrogance and hatred and all the strutting contempt and cruelty. We seek reconciliation with those we have hurt, and we forgive those who have hurt us. 
we commit random acts of subversive kindness. We mistrust power in all its manifestations. We are amused by those who take themselves too seriously, especially politicians and clerics. We challenge cruelty in all its forms, religious and political. We listen to the poets who exhort us to love extravagantly and without caution and calculation. Yes, the new order is already here, spread out upon the earth. It never wins, but nor is it ever completely defeated, and we are all invited to join the struggle. But not grimly, not in hate, in love, and with the laughter of the children we cherish anew. And that's why I remain a member of the Christian church. I choose to live by the story of the magnificent defeat of Jesus, because it forgives me my own cruelty and gives me courage to withstand cruelty in others. And there's too much cruelty in our world. I, remem I remain a member of the church because it keeps the dangerous memory of Jesus alive. But I'm not suggesting that how I tell the story, the Jesus story, should convince anyone else. I'm no longer in the convincing business, the confident man-splaining. It's just that now this is the story I try to live by. I hope you have won as well even if it's different or even opposed to mine. But whatever your story is, I hope it doesn't make you cruel, and I hope it helps you withstand cruelty in others. So there we are then. My answer to the question I began with is that, yes, I am a Christian, just not a very believing one. And I'm fine with that, whatever anyone makes of it. Sorry, Ivan, I'm holding on to my ticket. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. It's very, very difficult to be so honest and vulnerable uh, and to talk about something so directly and something that some people think is so unfashionable. I wanted to ask you the first question. I haven't prepared any questions because I just wanted to ask and do prepare yours. But we sat on this stage a year ago uh, about, and we talked about impending death, mm -hmm. faith. It was a bit knockabout. We had a bit of a laugh. We loved it. Yeah. We had a bit of a laugh. This is very, very serious, uh, vulnerable, and even angry. What has happened to your thinking in the last year? It's partly because um, I'm getting close to the edge of the wood, uh, as I said, and I'm beginning to think about the human condition, and I'm beginning to realize that I am a pessimist about the human condition, and I think pessimism is a good guide to our politics and our theology, because we are um, very damaged creatures, and unless we build in structures of compromise, structures that moderate um, the, di the things we can do to each other, we will destroy ourselves. I lived through World War II as a wee boy, and I can remember we, we shattered Europe, um, large parts of uh, the rest of the world, um, and a bit of me sees the human community at the moment just roiling with anger against itself. Um, uh, the, the narcissism of minor differences written large and published high, and so I think that, that uh, it's making me angry and sad, um, and I want to tell the story. And I, I do think that, in fact, um, the, the biblical fictions, and I get angry at people who historicize the Bible because they, 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 use the loose, they, 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 they lose the use of it. And it seems to me that if we, if we can read these ancient creative fictions, which religious stories are, they help us to understand ourselves and challenge our own badness. And I think that more of us need to be doing that. I mean, including in our own country. Do you think sometimes people are embarrassed 
to talk about being in mysteries, as in Blake, the best lack all conviction, while mm. the worst are full of passion mm. and mm. certainty. Do you think there's this, because it's so complicated, it's very hard to explain, and people think that when you're talking about mystery, that you're being vague. Mm. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people fear uncertainty because it, it's a very insecure feeling, um, and I think that's why we manufacture certainty. I mean, it, we kind of psychologically make it up in order to fill the possibility of that abyss beneath us. But if we live with uncertainty, it makes us gentler to others um, and more open and responsive um, to admit possibly that we're wrong. That the thing about my life is that I've been so wrong about so many things over the last 85 years that I've lost the capacity for pointing to certainty in anything except the danger of certainty itself. Well, also, the problem about this sometimes, I think, is the danger of finding certainty in the self so that I always think that we've moved now from, um, in this political age, we've moved from a time of, um, I think, therefore I am, to I say mm. it, therefore it's true. Mm. Uh, the only mm. thing that people think they can believe in, everyone wants relatable characters, don't they? They want relatable characters in fiction, things that relate to their own experience. They can only trust their own experience, and we've lost sight of, perhaps, of the community of believers, mm -hmm. or the fact that perhaps the greatest um, wisdom and strength comes from outside ourselves. I agree with that, and I think one of the sad things about the decline of churches is that we were saying this coming in, that people come to this place because they want to engage with ideas and with, with one another, and with the decline of religion in our culture, a lot of those spaces and places where we did that, where we could be challenged to think um, about the neighbor, um, to own and admit our own falsehood and deceits and mistakes and things. Uh, we no longer have arenas in which we can do that. That's why this festival is so wonderful, because it does enable people to come. I just wish that the churches themselves became more generous and more spacious and used their stories more as creative fictions than in trying vainly to historicize them, because that's what's chased people away. Um, uh, we were talking, uh, I went to, I, I'm a writer, and I went to Salisbury Cathedral, uh, I went to Salisbury to give a talk, and I went into Salisbury Cathedral, and mm. that, for Evensong, and there were like 15 people yeah. there, mm. and a choir, but 15 people in attendance, and I thought, this is doomed, this is mm. doomed, mm. this is mm. going to be a, a museum in 100 years mm. or 50 years, this is doomed, and with it, I got this incredible sense of tearfulness, loss, and regret, yeah. and I've noticed and I'm sorry to be so personal, but this is a, a space. I found it very upsetting, and I've noticed that you, when you become at your most religious, you are on the verge of tears, like there. Uh, do you find yourself, because I certainly do, find myself crying at the loss? Oh, do I do, because it, it mirrors lots of loss myself, but it's ultimately all about loss in a way. And I, and I, I miss the loss. I mean, Philip Pullman said, and he he writes against Christianity, but he said, interestingly, he said, the, the, the one good thing about the church is it kept the memory of Jesus alive, and the memory of that man who challenged what we're talking about and died for it, a young guy. Um, and, but he left this extraordinary revolutionary idea of the upside-down world. And when you think of the way the world is organized for the wealthy, for the powerful at the moment, the poor are getting more and more flattened by it. I mean, it's appalling, which is why the whole apocalyptic idea, there has to be an answer to this, but it doesn't come by magic. It will come by good people challenging the cruelty of the people who, s who live above there. And, yet, and what's not to weep about it? Um, and I think that that's uh, in those sacred spaces in particular, especially when they're empty, that's when they speak most strongly to us about a story of an unconditional love. Absolutely. Do you think, though, that we've lost sight of Jesus? It's, it's mm. almost mm. embarrassing for some people to mention Jesus. By the way, if you want to keep a seat on your in the train next to you, vacant on a crowded train, mm. and they say, oh, is this seat taken? You just say, only by Jesus. <laughs> and it remains vacant. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, mm. yeah, people are embarrassed by Jesus mm. and everything. But I think I'm writing this novel about Bach, as you know, and, mm. um, and mm. the St. Matthew Passion. And as I've been writing, I've been thinking that 
you know, everyone's been fixated on how does God, which is your talk, how does God allow the suffering mm -hmm. of children? Mm -hmm. How does God, what does God allow? How can God permit it without, the Dostoevsky, without God, everything is permitted. Mm. Surely the answer, and maybe the church and Christian writing has lost sight of this, lies in the figure, either historical or imaginative or poetic or mystical, of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And people are very, very embarrassed, mm. of, and clerg even clergymen are embarrassed about saying Jesus Christ too often in the same paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look what the church did to him. They divinized him. They dressed him up. Um, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, they, they, turned him in, they turned him from a bleeding, challenging, angry, compassionate, weeping man into a kind of God figure. Yes. I mean, they spent 400 years doing it. And I think, okay, maybe because they thought he was wonderful, but they kind of lost him in the doing of it. Mm. Um, and I think that uh, you can maybe believe all that as well if you want to, if that's the story you need. But please bring the Jesus, the human Jesus back, because that's the one that actually you know, washes the feet of the poor and does the stuff and challenges the powerful. No, not the guy up in the stained yeah. glass window. Um, so I, I think in many ways, what happened to theology is what men do. They, they, they somehow, they, they contrive to turn these stories into something they can use. It's almost another kind of power trip. It is part of this mansplaining thing men do. We are, we are kind of toxically violent about stuff like this. Um, and you can even turn theology into, into a fist. Mm. Well, I mean, we see it at the moment in the world. Yes. Uh, while, while we're here, do you think women priests have made, a, I think they've made a real difference to the way in which uh, our faith, uh, our faith, <laughs> whatever you, <laughs> our faith is it promulgated. Yep, I agree, which is why I, th I think that um, um, the leader of the Green Party who wants a kind of all-female cabinet for five years would be quite a good idea. I think in some ways, I think women and I, I don't want to fall into the opposite mm. trap, and a lot of women will rile against this, yes. but on the whole, I think they have more of a capacity uh, for, for compromise. Um, th th there's there's um, a phrase I love, the, the professor who taught me ethics used to talk about an equilibrium of mutual dissatisfaction. You, you reach a situation that no one's satisfied with, but all can live with. Men aren't good at that, men want to win. Yes, I, sp I suppose they, w when I'm with you, I'm happy to concede defeat there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, do you, uh, I know you're attracted to storytelling, mm -hmm. and um, do you still consider the parables? Oh God, yes, because they're the stories Jesus told. Yes. Um, and if you read them right, I mean, they're revolutionary. Um, the, the, the story of the, of, of the prodigal son is about the God who rushes to forgive us before we even get a word of confession out. Um, the story of, of, of the Good Samaritan is, is a story about how religion um, can, can lock us off from compassion. Because the reason the priest and the Levite passed by on the other side was because their religion refused to allow them to go to the aid of the man who'd fallen among thieves. Um, and Jesus one of the things that worried Jesus most was the way religion becomes the enemy and the opposite of, of the God of love that he believed in. Yes. I mean, I know this from my own experience. I mean, I can remember ugly beliefs I had uh, as, as a young man trying passionately uh, to, to find that simply to, I, I, mean, I can remember the fight in our own church even to get around to ordaining women for God's mm. sake. Yes. Um, and the, the big struggle we're having at the moment uh, the, the Scottish Episcopal Church has resolved is whether gay people can get married. Yes. Come on, how dare they? You know, that kind of stuff. And it's religion that traps us in these, these, four, these idolatry sets of opinions. Um, and in fact, that, that, that's why I think we should, we should read uh, more creative work and, and less philosophy and philosophy that think they've got it sus. Artists feel this stuff. They do, but not everyone listens, and that's, that's the issue, isn't it, really? I think that you know, priests and politicians and the media, um, that k phrase from King Lear, dressed in a little brief authority. Mm, mm, I mean, you mm. were dressed in a little brief mm. authority. I and threw you the hat away, your, you though, yeah. Turned the back, you turned your yeah. back on it, yeah. and like Lear on the heath, you yeah. went a bit mad for a while. Um, uh, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> thank God you're back with us. Um, but um, do, you feel, do you feel sort of free? 
Yeah, I do. I, oh, I mean, it's a, I, it's, a, it's a contradiction, isn't it? I mean, I love it and I loathe it. I mean, when I watch the guys in the big hats um, uh, parading into the Vatican, I mean, I love much say about the Roman Catholic Church because it does a lot of stuff with the poor. But when you see all those big, overweight men walking into the Vatican, um, that's what men like to do. When you watch, when, when Trump came um, to England, um, uh, whenever it was, and you saw all that you saw the power structure of England with all that salad on their chest, all that stuff. I mean, yeah. what is it about that? I mean, this need to get yourself all panoplied up. Does it does it make this wee skinny naked self inside feel like something? I think it actually reduces you, um, and I think that side of life I would like simplified. I would like us to be a poor, naked, forked animal. I mean, Leith was, uh, Leo was right about all of that. Yeah. And the great playwrights, uh, playwrights and, and artists get this. Arthur Danto said, of, uh, he described the human animal as an ens representans, a being that represents the world back to itself. And we can't help doing it. Listen to people in the pub that were talking about the day I said to him, he said to me, we can't, and that's what I think art Religion is a great art if you know how to read it. It's, tr it's looking out and it's trying to represent that. I mean, Cezanne said um, the, universe, the, the, the landscape thought itself in him. And in a way, what religion is doing is thinking about the mystery and trying to represent it. And it's wonderful creative stuff. And I can listen to you and you can listen to me. But once you start defining and say, this is what it's all about, and I've got a uniform to prove it, then you've lost it. Well, you're not letting me in, are you? You're not, you're not letting me in if you do that. If you say, this is it, yeah, you're yeah. not inviting. You're, right. you're I locked think out. I'm locked out because great yeah. art, like yeah. religion and art, yeah. should both be yeah. a yeah. form of invitation, yeah. shouldn't it? I mean, it not only locks you out, James. You're pointing now. It gives Richard. me permission to... <laughs> <laughs> it gives me permission to, to punish you. Yes, does it? Yeah. 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 Careful. Uh, time for you <laughs> lot, I think. Otherwise, <laughs> not turning the other cheek, I'll tell you that. Um, Right. Um, anybody got any questions? Surely there must be some questions. Yes, in the middle here. Uh, gentlemen, could you just take the, the two next to each other? I'll take you two first, then followed by anybody over this side? Thank okay. you. Just go. Uh, and the, the back there, yeah. The back there. Thank you. Go. Thank you. It's been an honor to listen to your talk. Um, in, in my sort of quest in the Christian tradition, I found it much uh, better to look at Mary as the, um, as a source of grace and mercy and compassion. And when I think of Mary, um, that's where I get my inspiration from, uh, rather than her son. And I think about the mother of God, rather than God as a father, and was wondering if you thought about Mary in that way as well. Not quite in that way, but I do think about Mary. And it's, I mean, the, the hymn that she's supposed to have said is precisely what I've been talking about. Puts down the mighty from their seat, exalts the humble and, and me. And I think that it's interesting that the church had to bring Mary in at a certain stage because it realized it, it, it had pushed this toxic masculinity too far. It had focused it onto God. Um, and I think that um, Christianity, religions in general, are actually quite good at learning to balance themselves. And I think, I think the whole cult of Mary was a way of doing that. Um, and um, I think that, that, it's, that it's actually historically and psychologically quite interesting. Um, I still, a, l a little bit of me bristles when we sing too confidently about Mary, the mother of God, whereas I love when it's Mary, the mother. My mother was a Mary. So the name, deep for me. <coughs> Thank you. And gentlemen there, yeah. Hello, then thank I'll you very much for a fascinating uh, lecture. My question is, uh, again, about the political revolution being associated with the mystical and effective revolution you're talking about in, mm -hmm. in the figure of Jesus. Jesus, as a man, was made a god, as you said, mm -hmm. through the structures of the, through the structures of political structures of the church. How do we now make politics about humans again? Rather than about the structures that the, the structures that define them. God, I wish I knew. Um, I mean, yeah. but but it has to begin with with serious self-examination and serious knowledge about the complexity of the human condition. I mean, we are capable of rationality. We're also capable of of, of immense credulity. Um, 
I mean, when you think of all the conspiracy theories that are around at the moment, I mean, I don't know whether you watch the moon landing stuff. I mean, there are people who think that was all a hoax. Um, there are people who think the Holocaust was a hoax. I mean, we, we humans are capable of believing almost anything. I mean, you, you, can, never, you can never go far to be skeptical about our capacity for being reasonable and logical. We have that, but we also have the other thing. We're highly suggestible. We, f we, we roam in, in, in groups and packs, uh, and we turn on the weak and all of that. And I think that, that, that the getting it in proportion is the, is the accepting of the truth of that, confessing ourselves, our sins, understanding it. And it begins with, with the individual. Uh, once you know what, I mean, to die not knowing who you were, and so many people do that. And for, I mean, take a man like Donald Trump. I don't think Donald Trump knows a thing about himself. <laughs> I just don't. I mean, I have a pity for him. He's a wee lost boy. But my God, what he's, what, what he's able to do is he's like a kid having this colossal cosmic tantrum uh, because of all the mistakes that, that went into me. You need to feel compassion and pity for him, but you also need to be able to challenge and withstand that. Um, so it has to be a deep, deep honesty about the self, um, and it has to start with the individual. Um, and societies need... I mean, this society at the moment needs to ask itself deep and searching questions about the motivation of all the horrible things we've been doing to people of a different color, of a different faith, who come from another part of the world. I mean, it's pathological at the moment. It could end us. Um, and I think that one of the great things about the great religious stories is they point to that. I mean, the Hebrew scriptures are full of it. Um, all the Edens we banished ourselves from. Thank you. And, uh, of course, maybe the human race isn't meant to exist. I mean, it exists forever. I mean, that yeah, that's right. We may just be a little aberration. On, yes. on. Up here. Thank you. Thanks. And then Th thanks. Side. Thanks for that. Could I um, just add a gloss on that? When you talked uh, about Dostoevsky, I think if you'd have carried on with the, the Grand Inquisitor parable and so on, then you find that I thought Al Aloysia answered your question in the way in which you answered it because what he does is kiss somebody and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. goes away. Yeah, because yeah. what you get then is the possibilities of something different. Yeah. But it seems to me that's the thing of the two sorts of stories, because at one way you can understand there is no story that can explain why it is that children die. Yeah. But the world is like that. Yeah. So we experience the world as awful, evil, uh, uh, not evil, just grinding through. Yeah. And as we do that, we hope that there is something that enables us to live through that and deal with it. And that's what, of course, the story Aloysia sees the Christ as doing. And in a sense, of course, that was what Nietzsche thought. Because n when, when Nietzsche screams and yells at Christianity at one level, he says, at least Christ, it was Paul who invented Christianity. Yeah, because he didn't like Christ, the man. He yeah. couldn't live like Jesus. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, thanks for that. And I, the, the thing about Dostoevsky is he, it, it, everything's in there. Uh, rampant atheism, um, a humble theism. I mean, he was a great, I mean, I'm a great believer in a, this Caledonian anti zyzygy the existence of competing and opposing polarities in the same entity. I'm a divided man. And I think that in human experience, you have to say that, and then you have to say it's opposite if you're going to get anything like the truth. And Dostoevsky did that. He lived that. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the great parable of the Grand Inquisitor in the novel is precisely about that. Um, when, when the chief Christian, the, the, the Grand Inquisitor has to kill Jesus again because he says to Jesus, people can't cope with the freedom you offered them. We know you are true, but we can't live that way. Um, and so... And Jesus, again, kisses him. He doesn't say a word, he kisses him. So it's all there. I mean, the great artists, what they do is they, they represent the human condition. That's why we should read them and why we should read the great l religious myths as art and fiction too. And then they'll enrich us because they'll say, my God, that's me, that's us. Thank you. There's a lady over here. My apologies for this because it might just be because I'm in my 40s and I may look back on this in 40 years with embarrassment. But why the need to fictionalise the Christian story? Um, 
particularly the incarnation and the resurrection, those stories that tell us that in Jesus we not only see this radical commie Christ, as an Indigenous um, leader in Australia calls him, but God, that before Nietzsche was talking about scapegoating, we actually saw that God was willing to be scapegoated. Mm -hmm. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Only the Suffering God Can Help. Um, our current Prime Minister in Australia is a Pentecostal Christian. And if I was to approach him from a position that Christianity is a, a fictional story which may share meaning, it has a lot less resonance than if I say, the human beings you have locked up on Manus and Nauru Islands mm -hmm. are creatures made in the image of the God you profess to worship, who told us to welcome the stranger. So I, I understand a lot of what you're saying, but I'm not sure why that leads you to a need to fictionalise rather than to hold on to the, the absolute core of the Orthodox Christian faith, which is that in Christ we see what God intends of us. And it's a lovely story, and I wouldn't fictionalise all of it. Thank you for that. I mean, uh, Jesus existed, I'm quite certain of that. Um, I think that it, what I think has happened to a lot of religion, they've taken a lot of old fictions, clearly the Adam and Eve and Garden of Eden story clearly is a creative fiction. That doesn't mean to say it's untrue. Uh, true fictions are never outdated, but what happens to a certain kind of religious mind, it historicizes these fictions and makes them useless to the rest of us. I think that uh, a bit of that was going on in the New Testament as well. I think there was a bit of, of uh, mythicizing certain events. I think that whatever the resurrection of Jesus was, um, uh, it, it could have been some kind of psychic event. Um, I don't object to people holding those stories as true as well as being stories, as long as they make them kind and don't make them cruel. And the trouble with a lot of ways of historicizing what I think are true fictions in religion is that it does make people cruel at p because in the history of Christianity is that unless you hold in your head a particular set a particular understanding of these stories. In previous times, you could be persecuted. You could be burned for it. The great Athanasian Creed tells you that if you do, unless you believe this, you'll be damned forever. That's what we do. That, that, that's, religion takes these stories, historicizes them. Politicians do it as well. I mean, it happens in, in Marxist Russia. It happened in Nazi Germany. Unless you hold a set of concepts in your head, I'm going to punish you. Um, now, there are good ways of holding these stories, uh, ways that inculcate um, uh, love and kindness, and I would not challenge you holding the stories the way you do. As long as they make you kind, I can see from here that you are kind. But please don't fall into the trap of saying, this is how I hold the story. It makes me loving and kind. I believe that Jesus is divine. Um, don't fall into the trap of telling me that I'm wrong because I tell the story in a different way. And that's where the trouble comes. Live your story, believe it, don't make me believe it. Obviously, this is a, we've got one, can you be very quick, Yeah, please? I will, I will, thank you. Um, thank you to you both, thank you, Richard. Um, very briefly then, I'd like to go back to children. I've been involved with Scotland's oldest charity, children's charity for quarter of a century and um, we know all about the suffering of children in Scotland and we know very well about intergenerational abuse and mm. neglect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now I, I hope to believe I'm one of the underground movement and but I fear terribly for the unborn as it's getting worse or it's getting more obvious so Richard what thoughts have you had about what we can do differently for the unborn? Okay, um, let me preface what I'm going to say um, with, a, uh, with a remark. Isaiah Berlin, the great philosopher, taught me that the trouble with human ethical, ethical differences is they're rarely between an obvious good and an obvious evil. They're usually between rival versions of the good. And that's what makes them so, um, so taxing to deal with. And beneath your question is a question about abortion. I don't believe in abortion, but I, believe, but I do believe in choice. So here you have, you have that contradiction again. 
Um, I think that, that when we tried to outlaw abortion, we didn't do away with it, we just shoved it underground. It's a bit the same with drugs, we're making the same mistake there. If we could achieve um, a humanity that, that didn't that the need for it didn't arise, but we're never going to do that because of the mistakes we make. But that, I'm afraid, is the contradiction I live with. It wasn't about abortion. Intergenerational hope. Uh, how society could be made. How we can it, were you asking how we can bring up our children better? Yeah. 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 I mean, what actions are they going to take? How can we make? Oh, that was, well, sorry. I, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, got, I mean, almost everything I've been saying, in a sense, fits that. Um, I, I think we have created all sorts of... Di it, it's particularly difficult um, to uh, have the kind of atmosphere in every home in Scotland that we want for our children. We know enough about um, the impact of poverty on children in this country. I've spent months sitting on commissions looking into it. Um, and to me, it's appalling that in uh, th th this stage of civilization, we, we, we haven't cracked it yet. Um, I helped to found shelter 50 years ago. And I, w I was at its 50th anniversary, and I was ashamed that we still exist. We were founded 50 years ago to get rid of homelessness. The same is true. We never learned because of all the stuff we're talking about. If we could take a lot of the energy that goes into all this bullshit and put it there, we might make a difference. But it, you just have to join the Jesus revolution. Um, we have to stop. Wait, wait, wait for proper applause. <laughs> Richard is going to be signing copies of uh, any book they have in the bookshop. Um, <laughs> it is, um, it's, well, provided they're written by him. He won't be, <laughs> won't be signing I'll mine. sign anything. He won't be signing mine. <laughs> it's just at the cafe, um, just the far entrance to the cafe, if you'd like to go there or ask him anything, uh, but briefly. Um, thank you so much for coming. I mean, obviously, this is what a book festival is all about, these kind of discussions. They're very weighty, but we shouldn't be ashamed of seriousness or kindness. Thank you, Richard Holloway. <laughs> Love it.